This is Jason Hershey, designated broker and managing member of Telus Real Estate Solutions, LLC. Welcome to Landlord 101. This video series comes from our live Landlord 101 classes. In this first video, we cover the four things that a new landlord should do immediately upon acquiring a new rental property. These same tips also work for when you're changing tenants. I hope you enjoy these videos and find them useful. Be sure to visit our website, telusre.com, and give us your feedback so we can improve our classes in these videos. Thank you. Beginnings of being a landlord. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a, you a lot of information. You guys have been in my classes before. Know that I tend to just turn on the spigot and just throw a lot of information at you. Uh, feel free to stop me to ask questions. Uh, if there's anything that we're gonna cover later on, I'll just say we'll, I'll let you know that we are gonna do that. You know, or I might touch on it right then, just because it's convenient. Uh, also, if there's any questions after the class, you can email me, call me. Uh, I love to have fodder for uh, blog posts and things like that too, so it's great to get get, get questions. So, uh, the standard disclaimer, I'm not an attorney, so I cannot give you legal advice. Uh, I always like to say that I'll give you information that you can uh, take to an attorney and give you good questions to ask. Okay. Now the other thing to know is that there's a big difference between owning property in the city of Seattle and anywhere else. All right, so we don't really cover the details of the city of Seattle in this class, okay? Just because there's a lot of Seattle-specific stuff. So we're going to talk in in general uh, Washington State terms. What are the laws in Washington State? Know that any city that you operate in may have its own rules. Seattle's not the only city to have its own rules. Seattle has the most rules and the most tenant-friendly rules. Uh, but Burien, a lot of the places in uh, South King County. Are, are building up, they have a lot of rentals, and so they're building up a lot a uh, lot more rules, uh, partly because uh, along with the rentals, they have other problems, and so they're using the landlords to solve their other problems, things like gang problems, things like that. Okay. So what are we going to cover? We're going to talk about how to market your property, talk about how to screen tenants so that you can get good ones. We'll talk about the basic lease provisions. Uh, there are lots of classes that will teach you just about leases, uh, so we won't cover them completely, but we'll talk about the basics. Uh, we'll talk about how to meet your responsibilities as a landlord so you can stay out of trouble, and then if things do go wrong and you do have a problem, we're going to talk about the eviction process and what to do when you're getting rid of a tenant. So landlord basics. So I've got a, so I've purchased or I've inherited or Whatever, I now have my first rental. What do I do? Here's, here's the basic things that you want to do immediately. You want to change the locks. You want to start your insurance. You're going to start your search for tenants. And then you're going to start your repairs and cleaning. And kind of pretty much in that order. Right? Change the locks. You want to protect yourself from unauthorized access by any previous owners, any previous tenants, contractors, real estate agents, people like that. If you own multiple rentals, or even if you don't own multiple rentals and it's just one, I recommend switching out your locks in between tenants. You know, if you, um, instead, because you know, if you're paying, oh, it's only $75 to get it rekeyed. Well, $75 every time you change tenants adds up money. Whereas, it's reasonable to think that if I've got, let's say, three sets of locks that are sitting in a box in the garage, and, and it's my one rental, I can rotate through them you know, safely and know that, you know, the chances of somebody two tenants back coming back with keys are pretty minimal, that type of thing. Or if you've got a, a small apartment complex, you know, the locks are switching around, you know, all over the place, that type of thing. So, uh, insurance. You're going to want to start your insurance as soon as you own the property. You want to get what's known as a, a non-owner occupied insurance policy. Um, so if you're taking a house that you lived in and you had a homeowner's policy and you move out and you're going to rent it out, you want to change your policy. Happily, your landlord's policy is typically cheaper than your homeowner's policy. That's because they don't have to cover as much stuff. Your homeowner's policy covers all your personal belongings. Usually it'll cover even if, let's say, your camera gets stolen while it's in your car, that type of thing, your homeowner's policy will often cover that. So as a landlord's policy, it doesn't cover the, uh, the landlord's policy does not cover the personal possessions of the tenants. And so it, it's actually less risk for the insurance company, so it's cheaper. All right, you want to make sure uh, to have six months or greater rent loss coverage. 
So what that does is if, let's say there's a fire or a flood or some sort of damage to the property and you can't rent it out while it's getting repaired, it'll cover your, it'll help cover your mortgage payments. It'll get, you'll tell, you'll show to the insurance company what are my normal rents, you know, by showing them, let's say, your past lease or your current lease, you know, and then they'll pay you that rental amount six months or a year, depending on your policy, right? And then that way, you're not out of a lot of money out of pocket. You know that you're, uh, this fire isn't going to ruin you financially as, a, you know, as an individual. The other thing you want to do is make sure to get uh, liability insurance and make sure to get an umbrella policy. So an umbrella policy, what that does is it's an overarching liability policy that protects you from all angles. So your, car, your vehicle insurance, your liability insurance with your vehicle covers you, you know, if you have an accident, you know, and you hit, and you hit somebody with your car. Your homeowner's policy will cover if somebody slips and falls on the sidewalk at your house. Your landlord's policy will cover if somebody if slips and falls on your uh, on the sidewalk at your rental property. Well, what happens when? But all those policies have limits, right? And so, what happens if you hit the limit on any one of those policies? Then all of a sudden, somebody can come after you either personally or after your rental property, depending on how you own it. So you want to have an umbrella policy to add as an extra level of protection. And it's usually very inexpensive for the amount of coverage that you're getting. You know, again, because for the insurance company, it's not that risky because they only get hit for money after your other policies get hit. So do you suggest a million dollars or two or how do you, what's your... Uh, you know, it's one of those, that is a really personal decision for you. And it's really going to matter on how much do you need to protect you, you know, what's your love? What kind of risk do you have? You know, so uh, you know, and, uh, the, and the, some of the things that can vary. So, for example, let's say that you're somebody who is highly leveraged. You have a lot of debt, right? So I let's you know I let's say I own you know four properties and they're all mortgaged to the hilt. Well, I don't have any. I don't really have any assets at that point. You know, because I you know because people can only get. You can't get blood from a turnip, right? And so the amount of insurance that I need may be a lot less than if I own those same four properties free and clear. What is what level of risk am I willing to take? It's also going to be something that you mix with your ownership entity, which is something that we cover in the uh, investment class. So let's say that you own your properties in a, as an LLC, then that may limit your risk enough that you don't have to have as much insurance because it, you know, it limits the possibility that somebody can come after your personal residence. But something to talk about with your insurance agent. Okay. And most of all, uh, more of what I'd be concerned with is not just your limits of your policy, but what are your deductibles? That's usually the bigger question. You know, do you go with a $1,000 deductible, a $5,000 deductible, $500 deductible, $10,000? That's really because then what you're thinking about is how much can I afford to be out of pocket at that moment when something happens? How much can I afford? If I don't have, if I have a lot of savings, I can afford a higher deductible than I can if I have no savings. And if, I, and again, in that situation where I'm highly leveraged, I may have a lot of debts that I have to pay, and so I can't afford to take my current income from, let's say, my job and pay for. Uh, an attorney or something like that, I need to have the insurance cover it more quickly. That type of thing. Cleaning and repairs. So, uh, Peg said that uh, she's being very thorough about cleaning and repairs. That's very good. That's the most, cleaning is the most important thing that I think that you can do to get good tenants. Okay, and be detail oriented on this. So, clean window tracks, you know. Did you know that the rent, your range hood, you usually can pop it up and clean underneath? So do those types of things. Most of my tenants don't know that. <laughs> you know, those types of things. Be very detail oriented. I love it when we get tenants and they go, wow, this is the cleanest place I've ever seen. And we'll have tenants pay us a little extra money because they're coming into a place that's extremely clean. It also sets a, an expectation for the tenant that I'm going to get it back clean. I never get it back as clean as we give it to them, but hopefully I'm getting it back cleaner than it would be otherwise. I guarantee you that if I give it to them dirty, it's going to come back dirtier. 
repairs. You want to keep your repairs simple, quick, and permanent. You know, especially when you're going from between tenants, you don't want to be have your place empty for very long. You want to get it repaired and get it rented as quickly as possible. So when you're looking at your repairs, don't go overboard. You know, uh, you know, if the contractor says, you know, we can make all these improvements to it, well, if your place is, unless that's a competitive advantage for your property, don't worry about it. Just get it repaired. You know, uh, when you're doing, uh, do take the time to make the right fix because you don't want to come back and spend money on it later again. Uh, I see landlords that sometimes don't fix things correctly. Uh, bought a rental, uh, bought a property as a rental, uh, and the previous owner well, was very cheap on repairs. We went underneath the house, and what they had done is all the, anytime there was a water leak, and this was uh, the old uh, galvanized steel pipe, which leaks over time, every time it leaked, they repaired it with garden hose and, and clamps on each side. <laughs> you know, not a very good fix. <coughs> The whole underside of the house was wet. There was just the, the mold was growing like vines. It was disgusting, right? You know, caused more damage. You know, yeah, it was a you know cheap fix for them at the time, but really in the end, you know, it didn't help them. They got they didn't get as much money when they sold the property as they would have otherwise. You know, because that was a you know that they came off the price, the cost of all those repairs, things like that. So make the repairs, make them right. But again, don't go overboard. Painting, paint, you know, use neutral colors or white. This is, not, you know, your rental properties are not the time to exercise your uh, design flair, all right? And you also don't want to let your tenants paint. You know, always get tenants wanting to paint. And the reason is, is again, when you're going from, uh, from getting your place ready to re-rent after a tenant, you want to get in there, clean it up, if you've got to touch up the paint, touch up the paint as quickly as possible. It's much easier to go in there and do a really light coat of paint because you know it's the exact same color as you used last time, you know, and be done in a couple of hours versus, you know, having to spend thousands of dollars to repaint the whole house. Those types of things. You know, things that you can do, uh, you know, used to be, okay, just keep, you know, keep the color on the, on the can or, or keep one of those stir sticks with the color. You know, with Home, uh, with, uh, Home Depot and Lowe's now, online, you can say what you use. Uh, I tend to use the, the, the actual store brands. You know, like the Bear, they're off-white or something like that. You know, that way, you know, I, if either I or my wife or a contractor, I can say, here's what you get. You know, oh, I don't know what it is. It's off-white Bear. Great. You know, and then they go and get it, and I don't have to worry about even what the number was. This is Jason again. I hope you enjoyed this video from our Landlord 101 series and found it educational. Be sure to check out our other videos and provide your feedback. Please email or call if you need any help with your commercial or investment real estate needs. Again, thank you.